as I was preparing my comments, what I did, because I believe that the best way to track goals is you look at what you did last year. And uh, last year, not too far from this time, I gave my first town hall. At that point, I was the preferred candidate. I guess I'm no longer preferred. <laughs> I'm just what you have. <laughs> um, and uh, at, at that point, um, I noted that we were in the middle of difficult times. Um, state funding was dropping rapidly, and we had what we euphemistically referred to as crossing the Rubicon. That means we'd gotten to that point where less than 50% of the funding for our resident undergraduates was coming from the state or from taxpayers. Um, and uh, I had hoped at that point that things would be looking up a little bit more by now. Um, instead, we're now at the point where the share of each student's education paid for by the state has continued to decline, and now it's about 30%. Uh, that's really something that four or five years ago would have been unimaginable. Um, for those of you who prefer numbers to percentages, we entered the 2009 biennium with a little over $400 million in state funds. Now we're at about $210 million, while enrollment has continued to grow significantly. So that drop is magnified by the fact that we actually have more students. So that even with double-digit tuition increases, and I know how hard that's been for our students and their families, um, we're getting about $3,000 less per student than we did in 2008. Um, so here I am singing the same sad song, um, but I think at this point it's been playing so long that I don't know about you, but for me it sounds like nails across a blackboard. Um, it just has been um, really, really difficult. Um, you all know that we've been doing more with less, and you all know that how hard we've been working to get through this very difficult times. The numbers show that. But in lieu of new funding, which really is hard, our legislature really is in a bind right now, what we're going to hear a lot about is accountability. And not just from legislators, legislators but also from the public and from our students. Um, my own reaction to that, as long as I'm not asked to redirect money from education to assessment, is bring it on. There is absolutely no measure of accountability on which the University of Washington doesn't look good. Not only doesn't look good, but doesn't look, in fact, spectacularly good. Our graduate rate, which is one of the most, our graduation rate, which is one of the most straightforward measures of whether we're meeting our educational mission, is not only the best in the state for publics, in fact, the only um, school where it's appreciably better charges $40,000 plus tuition, um, our graduation rate is one of the best in the country for any school, public or private. Data analyzed by the Washington Monthly, which seeks to rate universities according to what they contribute to the public good, found that on a scale that they call the social mobility scale. And that scale is made up by looking at graduation rates, but also taking into account the provision of financial aid to students and also controlling for student demographics, such as the ethnic and socioeconomic composition of the student body, puts UW Seattle at number six in the country. And that includes both publics and privates. The only one of our peers to even make the top 10 was Rutgers at number eight. And their funding per student is almost a third higher than ours. Their state funding per student is more than double what we get. Um, in fact, I, I saw that when I was flying into Newark for a meeting in New York. There was a huge billboard um, that Rutgers had put up saying, we're number eight in social mobility. <laughs> well, well, we don't spend money on billboards like that. <laughs> um, when it comes to research funding, which is a rough measure of scholarly output, well, we all know that one. We're number one in the country for public universities. And even when you throw in the privates, we're second only to John Hopkins. Now, I know that this doesn't capture the work that we do in many other areas, some of our social sciences, education, humanities, and arts. But the fact that we're tied for number one in the country 
and the number of nationally funded Title VI centers, which focused on language and international studies. And that several of our arts programs, our College of Education, our School of Public Affairs, and our School of Social Work, are all top ten in the country, suggest that we're doing well there, too. And there are a lot of other indicators of quality that we can point to. For example, we've produced more Rhodes Scholars than almost any of our public peers. More than Berkeley, UCLA, Michigan, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Rutgers, Texas. In fact, the only public peer I found that produced more Rhodes Scholars than the University of Washington was University of North Carolina. They've produced 42, we've produced 37. And like Rutgers, their per student funding is about a third higher than ours. Their state funding is about three times higher than ours. Um, now this list has been pretty UW Seattle centric. Um, and Tacoma and Bothell haven't been taking freshmen long enough for us to get a good sense of their graduation rates. And they have somewhat different missions than UW Seattle. But I want to say they're doing extremely well too. If you look at their graduation rate focusing on transfers, they also are at the very top in the state. And by almost any key measure, they're the most successful branch campuses in the state. Combined, they serve more than 8,000 students, offering programs with high academic standards and developing some very innovative community partnerships. So UW students on all three campuses are not only of high quality, they meet rigorous criteria for graduation, and they graduate with a deep sense of public service. We're amongst the top in producing students who go on to become volunteers in the Peace Corps and at Teach for America. And then, of course, there's all those international ratings, whether we're talking China, London, or Korea, in which we are top 10 to 20 in the world. I could go on and on, but you know, I don't want to seem too self-congratulatory. You know, it's not the Washington way. Um, but like I said, when it comes to accountability, bring it on. Pick your measure, and we do extremely well, except in one area. And you probably are guessing what it is, state funding. Our per-student funding is not only a third less than that of University of North Carolina and Rutgers, which do pretty well for state schools. But as an average of our global challenge peers, a group that we're at the very top of in terms of quality, we get about $6,000 less per student from our state. Just yesterday, The Atlantic in its e-magazine published a list, uh, you could call it the Hall of Shame, of the 38 states that had slashed higher ed funding the most, guess what? We're right at the top, top 10. Um, that is not a top 10 list uh, that you really want to make. Um, so here we go, top 10 in graduation rates, research productivity, national and international rankings of quality in many of our programs, and also top 10 in recent cuts to our funding and close to the very bottom amongst our peers and not only state funding per student, but also in state funding plus tuition per student. I'm all in favor of accountability. Um, some of you know I used to teach a class on program evaluation. But accountability has to go both ways. Sometimes I have this fantasy, especially these days, that you know, I kind of wish we were a sports team. And that uh, you know, we could kind of say, if we don't get enough support, we'll move to Oklahoma. <laughs> You know, pretty soon we'd be at the very top and our state would be having to look at some second-rate team from some state I won't mention. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's like we would, we really are. Um, and like I say, you know, I apologize if I seem too self-congratulatory here. It's not self-congratulatory. It's really about the hard work that our students and staff and faculty are doing. But any state would give their right arm to have us. Any city would give their right arm. Any region would give their right arm. So. Um, it really has been um, very, very difficult. Um, we've all heard the mantra about how the cost of providing college education and the price that students pay has far outstripped inflation. And that certainly is something that's happened on the national level. 
when you hear these conversations, and I'm sure that you hear them. It is true on the national level, and it's especially true at top private schools. Um, their tuition has been going up, and uh, their percentage, you know, when some of these schools that started off at $30,000 a year, when their tuition has gone up 10%, um, that's a lot of money. And it has been going up faster than inflation. Um, these reports are true. Um, and here at the UW, it's true that our tuition increases um, have also outstripped inflation. But the cost of an education, at least at the, the at least at the UW, okay, the cost, not how much students are paying, but the cost, has actually been quite flat over the last couple of decades. We do not fit the national norm. Um, what we've seen here is not a cost increase, but a cost shifting from state taxpayers to our students and their families. So compared to many other universities, we simply haven't experienced a windfall in tuition cash to support our educational mission. It just, it happened nationally. It did not happen here. And so while what we've seen is that higher education as a sector grew fat over the last two decades, and so in the last four or five years they've been trimming that fat, here at the UW we never fattened up. And what we've been cutting is muscle and bone. It's been a tough and grinding four years for our faculty, for our staff, for our students. And I'm not going to begin to tell you otherwise. Um, so if I haven't brought you down already, um, I, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that the problems aren't just with a drop in state support. Um, the kinds of things that I said a year ago kept me up at night um, was I also worry about funding from the federal government that we know isn't in any better shape um, than our state governments. And that includes things like Pell Grants that help support about a third of our undergraduates. Um, and of course, cuts to NIH and NSF which support our research and also our health care mission. But with stagnant wages and extremely slow, an extremely slow economic recovery, we can't look at more double-digit tuition increases as a backfill. The elasticity is gone. Our students, their families just can't afford it. In fact, just last week, citing exactly these factors, Moody's credit rating downgraded their outlook on higher education, including that of highly diversified top flight private and public universities like ours, their outlook is now negative. Um, there are some times when you really don't want to get it right. Um, when I said these things worried me last year, I was hoping that, you know, gee, I am a bit of a worry wart. Um, and now Moody's kind of says, well, you know, guess what? It's now official. It's not just you um, that's worrying. Um, so, after a year on the job, I believe even more strongly now that if we want to maintain our excellence and our affordability, and we do, we just have to start rethinking everything that we do. We need to do things more efficiently. I know that that's, you know, that we have been at this so long that that gets tiring to hear. Um, but we have to do it. Hard times are pushing us to be agile in a way that, quite frankly, runs counter to our nature. We tend to be deliberate. We tend to be process oriented. Um, so what am I talking about? What, what is it that I think that we need to be doing? Well, um, I think I'll begin with something that is easy for us to agree, upon, agree on. We need to find efficiencies in our administrative processes. Um, so I think we do need to begin with administration. We also need to, however, to look at adapting new modalities and methods of teaching, which allow us to reach a broader audience, not only more efficiently, but hopefully more effectively. And we need to adapt new and more strategic approaches to our scholarship and our teaching, and our research, excuse me. We need to do that for our teaching. We also need to do it for our research. Or as President Young put it in his address, we must become tomorrow's university today. Now that might seem a little daunting when I say, gee, we need to do 
administration differently, we need to do teaching differently, we need to do research differently, we need to do scholarship, we need to do it all. You know, it sounds like, you know, a, a really daunting task. Uh, but the truth is that we have been making very clear and very steady progress in all these areas. And this last year when I've had a chance to really look at it up front, it's really pretty amazing um, the work that you've been doing in your units in every single one of these areas. Um, as I hope you know, and I, I know that you know when the provost sends uh, messages out over email that you know they seem to find their way into the outbox before they're uh, totally read. But so I hope you know this, but in case you don't, um, we started a provost report series. And what we're trying to do is document the work we've been doing in all these areas. And I hope you've had a chance to look at, for example, the two reports on teaching and learning in the 21st century that highlighted some of the work we've been doing, um, like flipping the classroom, which is a way in which, again, in terms of efficiency, we can really spend our time with our students much more effectively in discussion and interaction and less in terms of just uh, presentation. Um, we've also talked about the way in which we're trying to support our faculty in becoming more comfortable with online teaching um, and um, also using these different platforms um, for assessment and keeping track of their schedules. Um, in this way, by doing more online teaching, more flipping the classroom, more hybrid classes. Um, hybrid classes are a wonderful way of, you know, you still have the face-to-face -face component, but you also have the, you can also multiply um, your, effect, your effectiveness by using some online as well. It both helps our students who are here on campus. I'm a big believer in what students get out of campus life. It's not just what happens in the classroom, it's outside. But it helps give them, um, for our students taking maybe one of their classes online a year, or even one a quarter, gives them the flexibility they need to at times have um, a part-time job, at other times uh, to really participate in activities that are just as important to their education as what happens in the classroom. It also helps us reach out to audiences that are eager for high quality education, but for whom coming to campus just isn't an option. Just this weekend, I heard from Bruce Ballack, and I know you're out there somewhere. There you are, Bruce. Um, one of our past faculty senate presidents and past chair of our astronomy department, that the American Astronomical Association is using our two reports on teaching and learning as the nucleus for its discussions on teaching. So we really are reaching stellar heights Thank you, Bruce. Um, it's, it's fabulous to see that other folks are looking at what we're doing here as a model because that's what we strive, that's what we strive to do. Um, on the graduate level, in the health sciences, they're doing really cutting edge work to transform their training models to become much more interprofessional. So for example, um, they're putting dentists and nurses and pharmacists together in the same class they're looking at ways in which they can share training and share their curriculum. Not only does that add to efficiencies, but it actually also leads to a trained professional that is much more ready to work in today's world where professions have to come together. Um, and it really leads to a more holistic approach to health and wellness. What we really want to do with these efficiencies, it's just, it's not simply a way of saving money. Um, it's also, I think, in many cases, a way of preparing our students and ourselves to participate in a world where we really have to be a lot more conscious about waste of all sorts. Um, we've also issued a report through the two-year two to two-decade initiative on collaboration and research. And in this report, we have tools that allow our investigators to more easily find collaborators when they're putting together the kinds of large interdisciplinary projects that we'll need to compete and to become more productive. Um, Vice Provost Lidstrom has put together a report showing how we've been doing in terms of research funding. 
And what she points to, which was really interesting when I was looking at it, is that um, we all know that the research dollar, the federal research dollar in particular, has shrunk. What's happened here, though, is that we're competing for a bigger part of market share. And we're doing that largely because of these large, comprehensive, collaborative projects where we tend to compete especially well. Um, you also see it in terms of the way in which we're looking at building research buildings. Um, if you haven't been to the Molly S building, um, right down across from administration, um, and this is also the case for the Ben Hall building, those in South Lake Union, in Tacoma, the Water Center, and Bothell's upcoming STEM building, you really see them being built in ways that were very different than our laboratories of 20, 30, 40 years ago. First of all, they're much denser. Um, just the, you know, the, the equipment that's packed in is much denser. Also, investigators and students are grouped around common projects that use common equipment. So that, you know, at least in my day, um, the model was you had the faculty member and they'd have their space and around them they'd have their postdocs and graduate students and their undergraduates. They'd each have their own, you know, whatever microscope, uh, you know, whatever equipment they needed. And, you know, then there'd be someone else down the hall that had their own equipment, et cetera. And, you know, sharing just wasn't something that you did. And, you know, it was all about your team. Um, and if you look at these new buildings, um, they actually lead. Uh, it's not just that we can do a lot better in terms of the degree to which we can, you know, quite frankly, pack it in. Um, the degree to which we can do uh, research per square foot and be less wasteful. But there's a real added benefit, which is that collaboration. You have one team working side by side with another team, actually talking to each other, not just at meetings, but on a daily basis. And all kinds of magic takes place when you have different people talking to each other, coming from different, from, from different positions. We see that, too, in terms of the design. For example, the new Jones Playhouse um, does the same in terms of performance. The space is much more open, and it allows for a broader array of different kinds of plays to be staged. It also allows for much quicker and much more efficient scenery changes which leads to lower costs per production. Dense, efficient buildings with more flexible and shared spaces, and also more energy efficient footprints are what we're apt to be seeing in years to come. And it will lead, and it will support, and it will help us in terms of more collaboration, in terms of our research, our scholarship, our performance. In the next week, um, we'll be issuing a report on organizational efficiency, the administrative efficiencies. Our efforts to squeeze out even more efficiency in the way we do purchasing and academic support. A couple of quick examples. By fine-tuning lighting and heating in every building on campus, over the last several years, we've cut our heating and electricity bill by over $4 million a year. That's partly because we're a huge operation. I'm including the hospitals. I'm including um, the whole footprint. That is really good stuff. And again, it's not good stuff just because of the cost savings, although, believe me, that's what I'm focusing on. But it's good for the planet. You know, this is one of those win-win situations. We've also increased the use of electronic transactions for things like paychecks and reimbursements which saves us about $42 per transaction. So uh, 76 uh, in, um, in 2001, 76% of per well, now 76% of purchases were being done electronically in 2011 compared to 50% in 2008. Um, I was talking just uh, yesterday to Charles Kennedy, who was talking about how our custodians who at first, uh, in many cases, they're first generation. In many cases, English is not their first language. We're a little bit uncomfortable with electronic um, transactions in terms of their paycheck. And we've been working very well. And now they're over 50%. 
Um, and again, that saves to university-wide. Remember, we are a huge university. That's led to savings of about $20 million a year. Um, just that kind of cut in electronic um, transactions. And we've also reduced personnel, for example, in procurement services by two-thirds, from 162 FTEs in 2001 to 54 in 2012. And I actually got a question um, uh, by email that was uh, talking about, we, we talk about these initiatives, we use the word lean, and saying, well, I lose my job because of lean. Um, and the truth is that in some cases, what by using these, um, these methods, we allow people to work more effectively. Um, instead of pushing paper, um, they, can, they can do um, better quality work. Uh, for example, in terms of payroll in our departments, if we can have, if we can share the payroll service, we can have people doing more advising and working more directly with students. But in other cases, like in procurement services, by and large what we've been trying to do is this is a huge university and people do turn over regularly. And so we're trying to do, as we downsize in some areas, I'm trying to do it not through layoffs, but um, as much as possible um, through attrition. And we have done a very good job of then placing people in other units. That's one of the fabulous things of being large. So I've, I've answered one question already. Um, uh, and another example, and there's a video that we released that I hope you saw. Um, we talked about moving to a classroom management platform to Canvas. Again, we're not talking about 100%. I know that there's a few Moodle Moodleites out there in the languages, and that's been okay. But by really moving almost entirely to Canvas, um, by going to a common platform, we're able to save substantial amounts of money, not only in purchasing the platform. Now, those are savings, but that's a small part. Where the really big savings come in is in terms of training people. Um, whether we're talking about faculty, or teaching assistants, or students and how to really use this platform. So we save a lot in terms of training and support costs. So we're able to get a better tool to, better, to also to better support faculty and TAs in learning how to use it, while at the same time saving money. So I am talking about efficiency. I am talking about saving money, but by and large, it doesn't have to be a trade-off between quality and cost savings. We're really looking for those places where both of those things come together. Again, if we save in electricity bills, we're also saving in terms of our energy footprint. It's a good, good win-win situation. We are changing. I know that sometimes there's all these jokes about academics changing at glacial speed. Well, first of all, the glaciers formed this place, and it may be slow, but it's effective. Um, but in fact, uh, I, think the, I think the fact that um, probably John and Q citizen, or John or Q legislators, that they think we're moving too slow, and that uh, some of my fellow faculty members think that we're going way too fast, uh, means that we probably hit um, just about the, the right point um, and it gives me some modicum of comfort that we're about right. Given my own background, um, what I like to do is to do trials or pilots um, where we can see how things work in a smaller way before going to really big changes. Um, when we can, and we can't always do it this way, but when we can do pilots um, or experiments, it should give us the courage to be able to move a little bit more quickly and to take risks because we'll catch mistakes before they become a standard way of doing business. So I think that you're going to hear me talk a lot more about doing pilots and doing experiments to see what works. I put together these comments and I'm about to end for the dialogue. Um, on Monday, I came into campus early because it was Martin Luther King Day and we have a fabulous day of service where our fabulous students take a day on instead of taking a day off. Um, Adam, uh, you were a speaker and it was just a fabulous event. Um, and I sat at my desk and I streamed the inauguration while I was 
working on, uh, on some of these comments. And as I was taking these, you know, watching the inauguration, I heard Obama say, and I quote, for now decisions are upon us and we cannot afford delay. We must act knowing that our work will be imperfect. And I couldn't help thinking he was speaking as much to us in higher education here at the University of Washington as he was speaking to the nation at large. So I'm going to take a little bit of further liberty and paraphrase from another section of his talk and end by saying, we understand that well-worn programs are inadequate to the needs of our times. We must harness new ideas and new technology to remake the University of Washington and our modes of teaching and research and patient care. In order to educate more of our citizens and empower them with the skills they need to work harder, learn more, and reach higher. But while we embrace innovation and change, our public mission and our public purpose endures. We remain a university that rewards the effort and determination of every student, staff, and faculty. And we will only get there if, tempting though it will be, instead of pulling apart, we pull together. Because that is what this moment requires. I know that at times um, we're all going to think that there is an easy answer and clear alternatives if only those bozos upstairs, you know, could get their act together. Um, I, I sat there talking about those bozos. <laughs> um, but the one thing that I've learned over this last year is that if there's a simple answer, you probably aren't seeing the full picture or you're probably overlooking unintended consequences. The path forward is not apt to be in something in a very simple, just do this or do that. Um, instead, it's much more complicated and what I find myself constantly doing is trying to find the right balance of this and that. So let's talk. <laughs> Questions? As I tell my class, don't all speak at once. Okay, you're gonna. Okay, you're not gonna go to the microphone. I mean, okay, go shout. I, I don't like to come every single day, but thank you. I have a question that's only the provost could possibly do. Okay. So you've spoken about it specifically. You're in here. Yeah, I guess so. You've spoken about our greatness, our progress. I, I guess my question is how are we to enhance that greatness? If you had money to invest in some new area that academic culture, I'm not talking about hygiene and fashion, academic culture, where would you? Well, I mean, I, I, here's, here's my answer is I think that we just have to be brutally strategic. And rather than simply asking ourselves is what new thing do we want to do is what can we stop doing? And really looking, and I think we have been doing that. Um, I think mostly we've been doing that to some degree within departments. And I know departments who have taken areas and either put those areas together um, and, you know, worked more efficiently or grown one area um, and not the other. We're actually in the middle of a conversation about that. I, I talked about how proud we are about having more Title VI centers than everyone else. Well, with the federal government not being a reliable partner anymore, we're trying to rethink how those are going to happen and we probably won't have a center structure that's exactly like it was before. Um, so, you know, I, I think we are doing some of that. I, I, I know that, um, you know, I'm not going to say, you know, I'm not going to stand up here and say we're going to close this or close that um, because this wouldn't be the place to do it, um, even if I had um, the idea in mind. Um, I really do believe, I mean, I, I view the provost office as one that's much more facilitative. Um, I don't think that it's decisions that come, you know, I wouldn't make the decision from here and have it come down. Um, what I really urge everybody is, you know, within your departments, within your units, within your colleges, within your campuses, 
Um, to ask exactly that question that you asked, Bruce, is if I had to start from scratch, what would I really, really want to be doing? Is there an area out there? And I think it's, it's, it's a question of not just what's exciting, but what can we build on, um, given the strengths that we have here? I can tell you that um, from the provost office last year with um, the relatively minor investments that we were able to make because uh, most of the provost investments came in kind of um, you know, helping people get to flat line in terms of budgeting. But one of my investments was in terms of what we call big data. And part of why that was an area in which I made an investment is it seemed to make a lot of sense given the strengths that we already have. We have a number of top five programs. Uh, you know, we have you know, applied math is top five, computer science is top five, both of our statistics departments are top five. We have a very strong um, mathematics department. We have a number of social science departments that are very quantitatively oriented, our education department, our public affairs. So we have a really good, the iSchool, we have a really good infrastructure on which to build. Um, we've got a community that's very supportive with the number of information intensive um, companies that we have in the area from Microsoft to Amazon. This really seemed to be an area where I think we're poised to be able to become number one in the country. It doesn't hurt that this is an area that doesn't require big expensive equipment either. So that I can really see this as being an area. What I don't think we're in a real good position to do is say, oh, this sounds sexy and cool, even if it is, or this is sexy and cool and important, but, and let's start, let's start building from scratch. Um, I really think what we have to look at is where can we build strengths? It's that, you know, collaboration. Where do we have strong programs that we can pull together? I'm looking at the geography. GIS fits right into the big data. I mean, we really have a lot of pieces that we can pull from to be um, really number one, number two in the country in this area. So that's just an example. Hi, Anna Mari. Hi. How you doing? Good. I also want to thank you as well. Oh, hey, <clears throat> My name is Jamil. I'm a former student, also battling the cold, so please forgive me. Um, and, you know, diversity is, is a hot topic mm -hmm. on campus. And obviously, the UW has been one of the most progressive nations, uh, progressive uh, campuses on, in the nation mm -hmm. as far as diversity is concerned. Now, I studied uh, American Ethnic Studies here. I had the um, ability to travel abroad with the Mary Gates uh, Leadership Scholarship and um, also to teach, kind of facilitate some work groups as a graduate student. And part of that was, of course, um, trying to establish a community peace garden on campus. And what we found out along the way, and this is going to lead to a question eventually, yes, of no, course. Okay. Um, <laughs> this is a dialogue. That means yes, you get to talk to. Yes, exactly. What, we're gonna, what we found out along the way, of course, was you know what we initially wanted to do was we found out Bruce Lee went to the University of Washington, and we felt in order for the, for the campus to really represent this, this diversity, um, we could symbolize and, and reflect on, on the uh, contributions of various members of our community and celebrate them on campus. So we wanted to get something established for Bruce. And we worked with the administration, and we've been working with the Duwamish tribe and a bunch of other folks who have been historically um, silenced, I guess, in, in, in the way things have been so far. And what we've been able to do is to reach out and to mend some of those past wounds by bringing this positive contribution to campus. Right now, we're of course, we're in the funding process. We're trying to fund the $100,000 that UW is all on board. I guess my question is, how is something like that valuable to the campus? How does it help us um, progress in the future? And how can we all get involved in maybe helping to, to bring things like this and helping to fund things like this onto our campus? Well, you know, Jamil, you were, you were actually the one who um, made me realize I, I, uh, I really didn't before that we're on Duwamish land. And I think about that quite a bit, and I, and I thank you for pointing that out to me. Um, I think that symbols are important. I mean, lots of times, for example, in terms of this building, um, I can remember when, particularly in terms of the first floor, there was uh, 
there was a committee that was put together, and if you look at the drawings and stuff on the first floor, there was a real effort to make them represent diversity. Um, I think that the way that a place looks and feels can create an environment that is more welcoming or less welcoming. Um, again, you know, maybe I'm taking a little bit by the, by the inauguration, because I was writing this at that time, but when Richard Blanco um, was talking about your face, my face, was the, it was the first time I really felt my face. It really was my face. And that meant a lot to me. I you know, could feel chills. Um, so I think that those things are incredibly important. And as you know, I volunteered to do a snippet um, in terms of you know, plugging the work that you're doing. And I appreciate it. I would love to see um, this come to fruition. So I mean, I do think that those, I mean, in some ways, when you compare that to a course, or I know that our students are working hard on a diversity requirement, you think, what is a statue? What is, what is a, you know, what is a poem? You know, what does a, um, what does a painting mean? It, it actually means a lot. And so I appreciate you bringing that up. So I'd also say check out www.communitypeacegarden.com if you'd like to get involved. That was my plug right there. All right. <laughs> happy, to, happy to give you a plug. trade-offs between tuition, faculty salaries, how do we balance the competitiveness in keeping our faculty? Because believe me, from someone who's gone through it this year, it's a lot more expensive to rehire faculty than it is to keep the good ones. How do we think about that as deans in balancing our tuition and our faculty competitiveness? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, what, what's been, the truth is that uh, the combination of tuition and state support has always been what has paid for faculty salaries and faculty salary increases. We are a labor-rich enterprise. Um, what makes this university, I mean, yeah, you look at these buildings, and I'm not saying that the buildings aren't, aren't important, but our operating costs are 80 to 85 percent people. Um, so that always it's been the case that uh, tuition increases, that tuition and state funding has gone to faculty salaries. What's happened is um, with, the, with the state being in a very difficult suit, and I, wanna, and, I, and I don't want this to sound like I'm beating up on the state. They are in a very, very difficult situation. Um, and with the state not being able to come up with um, some regular new money as in the past, it's kind of made it seem much more confrontational in terms of it's either tuition increases or its faculty salaries. I can tell you that the principle that guides me, and I, and I talk to students about this all the time, and I think that as faculty and staff, we have a responsibility to make sure that this is true, is that you know, the, the guiding principle for me is value. Um, you know, it's really about value. You can have something that is simply cheap, um, as my mother might say. Um, and that's not, that's not a good value proposition. Um, and so that's what, without having um, top-rate faculty and staff, and without being able to keep them, um, the value drops, and that degree means less um, for our students. And you know, in, in a number of areas, because of our comprehensiveness, there's a number of areas where um, we really are the only choice if someone wants to get an X degree or a Y degree. Um, in some areas, you may have a choice of various schools, but if you want to get an X degree or a Y degree that's apt to then lead to graduate school, um, we might be the only choice. And so if they're not able to come here, um, and I mean to one of our three campuses, and get a good education in that area, they're going to pay a lot more for it someplace else. And so we do have to, again, as I said, it, it's, it's a balancing act. Um, uh, you know, it's been, and right now it really is brutal because the students have had, um, undergraduate resident students have had four years of double digit tuition increases. And, you know, we have to be very sensitive to that. On the other hand, we've had four years without raises. 
and we have to be sensitive to that. And so we're going to try and balance. Um, what I've told students, and I feel this very strongly, is that unless we see um, cuts from the state, and we're really hoping that we won't this year, and I think that's a realistic hope, um, that we're not going double digit again. I feel very strongly about that. Um, but at the same time, what we've been talking about with faculty is not just doing the 2%, trying to go above that. And so that's, uh, you know, we're running lots of numbers and we're looking at that and um, that's, that's where the conversation is going to focus. Um, I think we need to, I, I don't, I think we do need to, and I think the, the president is 100% with me and so are the regents, we need to do raises this year. There's just no question and it's got to be more than 2%. Um, if not, and the thing is that in the long run, and I'll, and I'll uh, uh, answer another question that, you know, most of the difficult questions actually came over email. Um, you know, there was a question about retentions and why are we doing retentions um, in this climate. Um, and, you know, again, it's a balancing. I actually think if we don't do retentions, retentions is not the way to do salary increases. So, you know, anyone who says this is a terrible way to have a faculty salary policy and this is a terrible way to do business, you're right. This is a terrible way to do business, so I want to acknowledge that. That is not the way that we want to be doing faculty salaries, is that the only way you get a raise is through retentions. That's absolutely right. On the other hand, um, if we don't do them, not only do we risk and do we in fact lose faculty and you know, I've got a list of faculty we've lost over the last four years, but in fact it costs you more. Um, we know that we've got a situation here where years of poor, um, poor funding. I mean, you know, the last four years have been boom, but you know, if you look at a 20 year, it's been, you know, this, this, is, this is a 20 year trend. And because of years of, uh, of underfunding, um, we can lose an absolutely rocking full professor, you know, kind of in the fullness of their research productivity. Um, and to replace them with a brand new assistant professor can sometimes cost us more. Um, not only that, but then there is, you know, all those things that come with hiring. Um, often, you know, there's uh, rebuilding a research lab, et cetera. So in fact, it, it, it's not a cost effective or efficient way to operate. Um, so we have to do, we, we can't do, we can't deal with another, um, four, another, another four years. We can't even deal with another year without having raises and it really is a balancing act and we'll be talking a lot more of that in the months to come, in the weeks to come as our budget situation becomes a lot clearer. Well, I mean, one thing, and, and, and I've had these conversations with, with students and faculty, is as much as we can be a united front when it comes to talking about the need for funding for higher education, um, and not necessarily, and you know, in other words, you know, within, you know, my mom always used to talk about things that you talked about within the family, and then things, you know, that there was the, you know, within the family, let's argue about where to put that money. Um, and, you know, I, I say this as this is going out to who knows how many other people. <laughs> so here's our strategy, guys. Um, but, you know, let's leave so those discussions. I mean, let, let's, let's have those discussions. And if they get pointed and they get heated, you know, that's okay. I mean, I really do understand. Um, it, 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 you know, I can put myself in the position of, of a student or, 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 you know, their parent who's been saving for a long time and they've been doing everything right and then whoa. Um, and so I can put, and I can also put myself in the situation of a faculty member who's trying to save for their kids um, college education and, and, and it's both sides. So it's okay if it gets heated, it's okay, but let's try and have that here. 
and to the outside world, particularly to our friends in Olympia, let's try and have a united front because in the bottom line, it really is about state funding. It's not that faculty are overpaid. Um, that's not the case and it's not like, you know, gee, students aren't paying enough, even if in fact there are some schools where tuition is higher, that doesn't mean our tuition isn't high enough. That's the best I can, I can say. Okay, I was actually, that was one of the questions that I had here that I, that I thought someone might ask. Um, let me just tell you what, and I'm going to talk about differential tuition while I'm at it, um, because that's been something that, that gets talked, talked a lot about at the same time that get, that get gets mentioned. Um, the university position is not, I mean, we don't have an official position on um, save get, um, you know, uh, dump get. Um, our position is that GET needs to be reformed um, because it doesn't give us the flexibility we need. There are many states out there that have GET-like programs that offer flexibility. So we are not pushing for the end of GET. And I, I personally both know some very high-end families that use GET and, you know, uh, but I also know some very middle class families that are really counting on GET. Um, so I'm certainly not pushing personally or as provost for an end to GET. Sometimes I've heard people say it's the University um, of Washington that's pushing for an end to GET. That's just not true. We have been pushing to get, to get GET reformed to allow more flexibility. And so let's talk about uh, differential tuition and how that fits into it. Um, if we had more students here, um, I, I'd probably ask, uh, ask you, well, I'll, I'll do it even without students. How many people here believe um, that we should charge the same for an executive MBA program as we do for a social work degree? You do, okay. So one person, anybody else thinks we should charge the same? Now we have two people who think we should charge the same for those programs. Okay. Um, I could go on and give a number of other examples. Um, we don't, most people did not think we should charge the same for those, two, for those kinds of programs. Um, by and large, the reason why we don't think, Can I yes, go ahead. I think we should charge the same if that's nothing because I think all degrees should not be nothing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I agree with you, Cody. And actually, there's, there's a really good piece. I don't know if, if anybody in here has read it. It's uh, Sylvia Federici. Uh, came out in 2009. Um, and it's uh, Education and the Enclosure of Knowledge in the Global University. And so that it, it kind of breaks down where, where education is, is, is going now. Um, especially in terms of, of uh, internationally, and so UW being one of these uh, global research institutions, we're, we're a big part of that. Um, so I do, I do have a few questions. Um, were you... Were okay, you let me finish this up and then, I'll, and then I'll get back to you, Cody. Okay. But, but I think that I'm, I'm glad you said that because, you know, one of the things that, that you know, one of the um, things about being a bureaucrat, and, and that's part of what my job is about, is that there is the, the, the idealist. Um, I honestly believe that education would be, should be free. I think there are countries that are much less rich than our country who have managed to do that, so I think it's possible. Um, and so I'm 100% with you. Um, but my job is to get this university through at least the next four years. Um, I'm kind of thinking about this as probably a two-term thing, and that's not gonna happen. <laughs> Um, and so my job is to get us through the next four years when, again, that's, that's not going to happen. And so I do have to think about um, what are we going to charge for various degrees. To get back to, to my analogy, part of why we generally feel, and I think that most people would feel comfortable with the fact that we charge more for a um, law degree or a, a MBA degree than we do for, let's say, a, a graduate student in English or for a social work degree um, is partly an issue of economic fairness 
these degrees are more expensive um, because the faculty is more expensive. In some cases, the equipment is more expensive. To train a doctor costs a lot more. Um, and also, there's, there's some issue of social equity um, that, again, not everyone who gets an MD or not everyone who gets an MBA is going to go out there and maximize their earning potential, but they certainly have a much higher earning potential than a PhD in English or than a nursing student. And so we already, so I want to start off by saying we already have differential tuition. And by and large, as a society and as students, we've bought into that concept. What we're arguing about at this point, or where there certainly is some tension, is in terms of undergraduate resident tuition and whether there should be differential tuition there or not. Um, I can't, without having a specific proposal, and there is no specific proposal right now, I can't say am I in favor of this or not, but I'm generally in favor of differential tuition, um, particularly, as, well, specifically in engineering and in business, um, where now the majority of public universities do charge differently for these degrees. Um, I think that there's two reasons why I hear many students, and I want to acknowledge that it's many students who are opposed to this. I don't think it's the minority of students, although we don't have a poll, um, is for two reasons. One is they think it's a backdoor tuition increase, that it's a way of increasing tuition without saying we're increasing tuition. And I recognize that. Without having a specific proposal on the table, um, it's very hard to explain that, in fact, it's a way of not raising tuition on everybody and keeping tuition lower on students who aren't in business and engineering. Um, so that, for example, if we had had the ability to do differential tuition, um, let's say a year ago, uh, tuition increase might have been more like 12% than 16%. Um, so that it really isn't a way of raising tuition the back door. It's a way of keeping tuition lower um, on our other degrees. Um, the other thing, though, that students are concerned about is the whole issue of access. Will poor students, will lower income students um, be able to get degrees in engineering and business? And in particular, you add to that, will we be disincentivizing you know, people from getting those degrees? Well, the truth is that here at the University of Washington, I don't know what the situation is like in Florida, but here at the University of Washington, our problem isn't that we don't have highly incentivized students who want to get these degrees and are perfectly prepared to do well in them. I work trying to incentivize students to get to these degrees. Sheila Edward Lang, we work together on trying to get poor um, ethnic minority students to look at the sciences and building. Uh, and the sciences and business, but particularly engineering is what we've really been focusing on. And there's nothing that breaks your heart more than these students not being able to get in. It's not an affordability issue, it's an access issue, it's an availability issue. We don't have enough seats for them. They're ready, they're prepared, and we help them transfer sometimes to much higher um, universities because we just have no seat at the inn. And I can't create those seats um, by taking money away from English majors and geography majors and sociology majors. Just can't do it. Um, and so for us, you know, access has two A's. It's about affordability and it's about availability. And right now at the University of Washington, our bigger issue is availability. If we go the route of differential tuition, and right now we can't. I want to be very clear, we can't. And that does mean that the only way that we can add seats, and engineering is particularly what we're interested in, is if the legislature gives us the money for it. And if the legislature gives, you know, I don't care how we get the money, if the legislature wants to give it to us instead of giving us the power to do different, that's fine with me, I want to be clear. You know, it's not like I have a preference of one over the other. I just want to be able to create more seats in these courses um, because we have really well prepared students, and I want to do it not off the back of everybody else because I think that's important. But if we were able to do differential tuition right now, there'd be some 
basic principles that I'd want in place. And one of them be that it's very clear that we have enough financial aid to cover those poor students. One of the things, and, and that includes middle class students, one of the things that's really, that was very compelling to me, because I want to be clear, when, I, when talk first started about differential tuition, I was very skeptical for the same reason that many students are against this right now. And part of what helped convince me was the fact that we have many people out there who are much more likely to give to scholarships to students than they are to give it to programs at large. It's some of the easiest money to raise. The other thing that I want to add to this discussion, and we'll be having, we, we may be having this discussion again depending on what happens, is that I also think it's very important that differential tuition not kick in until a student gets into the major. There are some real issues about, for example, a student who comes in as a freshman and says, you know, I want to go into computer science. Many of those students won't make it in, and I don't want them. I think it would be wrong to have them paying higher tuition for three or four years and then not being able to get into the field. Because part of why I think, part of why I, I feel that we can do differential tuition in business um, and in engineering is um, particularly engineering, gosh, there's lots of jobs out there and they're high paying jobs. Um, and so you don't want to start until you know that a student has gotten into the major. And once a student has gotten into the major, our record here is stellar in terms of them graduating. Probably gone too long in terms of this discussion. It will be coming up again, but that's where GET has been problematic, is that in many states, in fact, I'd say in most states, but I'm not 100% sure that's right, but in many states, GET is um, uh, tethered to the average tuition um, in the state. Here, it's tethered to the most expensive um, tuition in the state. So if we did differential tuition, um, it really would break the GET program. So we're hoping for reform, but we have not been pushing for GET to disappear. Cody. I promise you. Um, so um, just a, a few notes, and then I got a question. So um, you mentioned that the main costs are people. Um, I mm -hmm. Actually, I was under the impression that people are a huge major resource for the university. Well, both, um, yes. And the way that you were describing um, uh, maximum research uh, yielded per square footage uh, talking about efficiency, um, talking about trimming fat and all of this uh, came off to me very much as like this uh, improving the, the, the factory within that enclosure of knowledge, right? Um, and who knows, maybe it doesn't actually have to look like that uh, from the words you're using, but that's what I got, and that's what it kind of feels like. It, it, it so. feels very cold and mechanistic and bureaucratic and very unsexy. You're right. So I don't think it has to be, though. <laughs> that's good. Um, so then, well, I guess I'll, I'll, skip, I'll skip a bunch of the other <laughs> stuff and just Okay, and, and then the I'm going to take two questions, and we'll have sure. cookies. Um, so with all these problems of access and all of this, um, it... What it, would it look like in, if instead of um, trying to be more efficient on these dollars, um, if we actually allowed everybody to attend, to attend here and directly organize the resources here based around projects, direct projects um, that people are, are working on that are contributing to the community? Um, and so I guess my question is, with all, all of the, the resources uh, uh, from the state draining, not having th those anymore, um, but a growing market that you mentioned uh, that we're trying to be more efficient to, to fulfill and serve better, um, where are these extra dollars coming from uh, uh, in, in particular? And... Yeah, I guess I just, I'm just okay. hoping we can ponder that, uh, what it would look like to actually end the enclosure of knowledge at the university and allow everybody to just come here 
and work on projects. Like, why can't everybody access the library? Why can't everybody access these labs? Well, I mean, I, I'll, I'll give you first a, a quick answer to one of the things uh, you said is that, you know, part of why we are looking for these efficiencies, and, you know, even the word sounds kind of officious and whatever, but you all know what I mean, trying to trim whatever we can is because we don't think there are going to be new dollars, and we do want to be able to do new things, and we do want to be able to serve our students well, so we're looking for those areas where our dollars aren't maximizing human potential, and, and I do apologize at times, uh, you know, I've started talking like a bureaucrat, it comes with a job. Um, it doesn't mean that, you know, I don't think of people as costs. Um, what I was trying to get across is that in terms of where, we, where the university spends its money is actually on its people. Um, I do see our people as the greatest resource that we have, so I couldn't agree with you more. I also think that we are working on um, when President Young gave his talk, he talked about a number of themes, one of them being turning the university inside out. And I think in a number of ways, from our participation in MOOCs, um, from some of the events that we have on campus. Um, this weekend, uh, after, I, uh, after I was working on this talk and um, streaming the inauguration, I walked through Montlake Phil. Um, that's the University of Washington. It was actually a really pretty day, if you remember Monday, and it was full of kids and families, and they were running and they were playing, and this is the University of Washington, and this is yours. So we are looking for ways to maximize bringing the community in. I don't think that in the next four or five years, we've had lots of conversations that, you know, we're going to get to the point where um, we're going to be able to offer our education totally for free. But I think there are lots of things in the university that the community can access at no cost, and I'm very proud of that. How are you thinking about consent, though, and the... Let me take these other questions, and then let's hang out. This embrace that, mm -hmm. that you're telling us that we have to take of the new road, like of this plan you just laid out. Mm -hmm. like. Cody, let me get some of the other folks who are waiting, and then we can, we can talk some more. I, I don't, I don't want to cut you off, but there are some other folks. Okay. Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Tiffany Sin. I'm a second year graduate student in the mm -hmm. School of Public Health. Um, I represent other people in my cohort and other programs um, that are very concerned with rising tuition costs for graduate mm -hmm. school, Absolutely. as well as the trend to turn f uh, regular tuition, flat fee um, graduate programs into fee-based programs. Um, in particular, my program um, switched over in the past two years and we've experienced um, about a 50% increase in tuition in just two years. Um, so we're very concerned. Um, and we're also concerned because there doesn't seem to be many policies in place to really fully support students who are in these new fee-based programs or continuing. Um, I appreciate that you mentioned that there's a differential in graduate schools, that an executive MBA might be charged more, um, but someone who's in the Masters of Public Health program, I'm paying $5,000 extra per quarter um, for the same MPH degree. Um, and on top of that, I've obviously, I, I want my education. I've sure. worked actively to look for TA ships and scholarships and taking out loans and financial aid. But there doesn't, but we've, there's several students and I, mm -hmm. we have not been able to get these support systems because we don't qualify for state sponsored right. um, funding because we are pl completely paying out yes. of pocket. Um, so my question was, First of all, um, do you have a criteria when you're moving graduate programs from flat fee to fee-based, and what are those criteria? And secondly is, do you have any plans to better support your students in these graduate fee-based programs? Okay, let, let me, um, let, let, I'm gonna, get, I'm gonna get to your answer, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go hopefully not too long. But you know, what we've seen historically is that in these periods of real downturns, We've seen a number of periods, I think 2001 was one about, uh, I think there was about 2003 where we saw a bunch of programs transition from state supported to fee-based programs. And fee-based programs mean there's no state support in them. Uh, you know, I, I sometimes think it's kind of ironic because uh, a couple of other universities in the state got lots of applauses from the public and from uh, our legislators because those programs were closed in essence, that's what we did when we moved these programs to fee base. We closed them in terms of our state support, but we found a way of being able to save them. 
And, you know, in many cases, and I don't, I haven't studied yours specifically, but in many cases, the option was we either close them down altogether or we put them in fee-based. Also, to put things in perspective, you know, it's, I, I understand that your fees have gone up 50% in two years. Our undergraduate tuition went up 50% in four. So, you know, I mean, it, it's been hard on everybody. Um, and we generally, if you look at the cost of graduate versus undergraduate degree, because of the close contact you have with faculty, our graduate degrees are more expensive. Having said all that, what we're doing right now, because um, in many cases, and, and I don't, again, I, I don't want to speak to your program specifically, but this was happening so quickly that I'm not sure that I don't feel comfortable that we did the thorough examination that we should do before taking such a drastic step. So last year, we called a moratorium on changing state-supported programs into fee-based programs. Right now, you can't do it. So that kind of thing has stopped. And what we're doing, together with Board of Deans, together with faculty, will involve students, is coming up with some criteria for when, we, when we're going to do that and when we don't. But I do want to say that probably in some cases, either we do it fee-based or we're not going to do it at all. But we are, but I totally understand, and we are, I don't have that criteria to give you right now, but that's what we're working on. And how long will this morat moratorium be held the in place? The moratorium at this point, it's a soft moratorium to 2015. Um, basically, we will probably, once we come up with a criteria, we'll end the moratorium, but at this point, it's a soft moratorium until 2015, which is quite a while. Okay. Thank you. All right. And we'll take that question, and then we're going to do cookies and cider, because I promised. <laughs> yeah. Hi. So um, I'm an undergraduate uh, in industrial engineering. And uh, so uh, first, uh, about differential tuition, uh, it's personally a little bit terrifying to think about it. I understand. It, but uh, <laughs> that, talk about that so, maybe so some I, other I'm glad, time. I'm glad you were here, because I, you know, every once in a while, I get accused about saying things behind closed doors. I talked about this fairly openly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but as an industrial engineer, I love uh, the word efficiency, and I, I also agree that uh, I think that the biggest solution to our budget problems is going to be in becoming more efficient. And uh, what I had to say was as much a thought as it was a question, but um, personally I've, I've been a, a little bit disappointed at times with the quality of uh, lectures at, at the university. I, I think at any university it's kind of spotty. Um, and uh, I, I've also found that uh, a lot of students, including at times myself, uh, are not very as much engaged in campus activity and interaction and are more basically just trying to go get a degree on our own, uh, learn the things that we need to, pass the tests and, and get out. Um, and uh, I think, uh, wouldn't it be mutually beneficial to allow students to take uh, full course loads uh, along the lines of what you were talking about earlier with uh, online classes uh, in the lecture style courses uh, which in my case is the vast majority of my classes are lecture based um, for quarters or years at a time uh, entirely online and off campus uh, which would allow students to have more flexibility and also higher quality of lecture style education um, and also allow the university to fill its campus full of more people that are ready to interact and engage with the community around them uh, and also uh, basically just be a part of it and help it become better instead of having the university be full of a lot of students who basically just want to get their degree and, and get out, which they could do just as easily online in most cases. Okay, well, I mean, uh, I, I, I actually do think that what we are seeing now is more diversification in terms of the higher education market and the kinds of options that you're talking about, um, if they don't exist now, are, are apt to exist. And there are actually places where you can get, um, I don't know about mechanical engineering, I don't know how much lab-based work you have to do, but where students can get degrees entirely online. Um, I wouldn't say that at this moment, at this time, um, there's, uh, there's uniformly high quality there, just like, in fact, there isn't in terms of daytime programs either. I do think that I'm actually a big believer in campuses. I, don't, I, I do think that, 
as at least I would like to think that many, um, and that in fact most of our students, and, and both my niece and nephew went to school here, and it took them a while to get into the swing of interaction. They were both on the shy side. Um, but I really do think that, uh, that being here with other people, engaging, uh, participating inside and outside the classroom, that's the kind of experience that I would want for those people that I love the most. Um, but I understand that there are a number of reasons why that's not the case for everybody. Part of why we're looking at things like flipping the classroom is I do think that sometimes if a class is entirely lecturing, and I don't think that's most of our classes, although I don't know enough about your program, that it would be um, better to, in those classes, do some more flipping. And it's, pr it's probably not the best use of your time or of the faculty member's time to be giving the same lecture year after year. Although in some cases, we have some pretty scintilla scintillating lecturers. Um, but that probably isn't the best use of time, which is why we're looking at more interactive approaches. Um, we're also uh, doing a lot of talking about um, having more options for online. Again, not so much so that a student here would do all their work online, but so that they can do some of their work that way. And I think you're right that lecturing online certainly uh, shows all the defects. I don't like to watch myself um, <laughs> afterwards uh, because, you know, everything, you know, all the ums, and you have to get really good at it. Um, so, you know, I, I think there's something to be said for what you're talking about. We are, what we're moving towards and what we're having some discussions about is um, developing some online courses for undergraduates where they take their first two years in person. I don't know how you could, I mean, I know that you have to have lab courses um, in your first couple of years, and I don't know how well that would happen online, but where you'd have your first two years here and potentially finishing up online. I think, though, all the research tends to suggest that that tends to work better for um, the non-traditional student, by that I mean students over 25 who know exactly what they want to be and are highly motivated um, rather than the more traditional college student. It sounds like you know exactly what you want to do and you're on the fast course out. I don't think that you're the typical undergraduate. Um, at least when I, you know, I went through five different majors, et cetera. But I do, <laughs> and I loved every single one. Um, it's true. Um, so I don't know how typical you are, but we are stretching to make sure that we can provide a good service, both to those students who maybe want to dabble a little bit here and there that aren't as motivated as you are, that don't just want to come here and take the courses and leave, but it's a large state university. I also want to figure out how we can serve you better. So thank you for your question. Thanks. All right, cider and cookies. Thank you.